that I had a responsibility in it. I wasn't an innocent victim, as it were. You know, you, you could say that George, George loved well, if you could understand me loving well. And, and whilst that was contrary to his needs or wishes or whatever, he could understand. In a sense, I think he never blamed me. I think he blamed Lau on not me. It got very complicated because George and Andrew, far from becoming rivals and kind of having a, a, a duel at dawn, far from George challenging Andrew to a duel at dawn, George kind of welcomed Andrew into the fold and Andrew became a kind of member of my family, but without me there. And there would be Sunday lunches and Saturday suppers and dances and ever shouting. And they were, you know, they were part of, he was part of that. And of course I was, I felt like I was living in exile. I felt like I'd been exiled to this foreign country, albeit beautiful for one, and it was six miles away, but I felt I couldn't have been further away. And Andrew was welcomed into the bosom of the family. And I think that caused enormous resentment for me. I know it did. And I don't know whether Andrew ever understood that, what it was like on a Sunday to know that he was having lunch with my daughter and my son and my ex-partner. And I was here. What then happened was that um, Mum's relationship with Andrew didn't last. And I still continue to see Andrew because he you know, lived just around the corner. And um, I know that she found that incredibly hard, that when, despite the fact that she wasn't seeing Andrew. That, I still was his friend and she felt sort of excluded from my new life and I didn't think she had much, much right. I've heard people say that it's impossible to have a relationship. You can't stay with the person you leave your family for because there's too much guilt and emotion and... Do you think the fact that you left George for Andrew ultimately meant that you couldn't continue this relationship with him? Yes, I do. I don't think it's impossible, but I think it was, if not inevitable, it was quite likely that those seeds of destruction that were kind of laid right at the beginning and blame um, did, did in the end undermine our relationship. Do you wish that you could turn the clock back? No, because at that point, I think I was still completely obsessed with Andrew. You know, this idea that love being a madness. So I don't think at that point I, I did wish I could... I think it was much later I would wake in the night with the window on the wrong side of the room. Sometime around dawn or before dawn, I think. I just think, what am I doing in this place? How have I got here? And it was as if I'd slept walked out of my other life with no explanation and I'd woken up and here I was and it was truly terrifying and I think that as long as I was damaging you lot I was kind of really not aware but it was when I came to damage myself that was when I really woke up because I lost you effectively I lost you between the ages of 13 and 18 so my biggest loss was losing you for five years at puberty, you were 13, you were just about to have your first period, you went off to George to Africa, you came back and you looked different. And actually, with maternal intuition, which I obviously didn't have much of, I remember looking at you and thinking, she's changed, she started her period, she's becoming a young woman. And sure enough, you told me, and I thought, God, George was there for that. Her dad was there for that. Why wasn't I there for that? Um, and I think, I think during that whole time, really, we didn't... We didn't really talk about how we felt, did we? No, I don't think so. Ruby Wright. She does a music show called Ruby's Chicky Boil Ups. It is every other Sunday on RadioNowhere.org. Her website is Ruby Wright. That's W-R-I-G-H-T dot com. Coming up, what to say to your parents about the rich married guy who set you up in an apartment when you're 22 years old and what to say to yourself and other dilemmas, cheaters and cheated on in a minute. Chicago Public Radio and Public Radio International when our program continues.
It's This American Life, American Glass. Each week in our show, of course, we choose a theme, bring you different kinds of stories on that theme. Today's show, Infidelity. Recently, when CNN did a story about Elizabeth Edwards, it was interesting to read the comments on CNN's website. There were nearly 300 comments, a lot of them just vicious, calling her crazy, calling her delusional, calling her an idiot to stay with her husband, John Edwards. But a few women wrote in to say, it all seemed more complicated than that. One posted this, I am in this situation right now. It's a difficult call to make. My mom was a psychologist and she specialized in couples where somebody cheated. She treated hundreds of these couples. She did studies looking at hundreds more. She wrote a book about her findings. There's solid research, a variety of researchers have shown that in one out of two couples, one or both partners will cheat during the lifetime of a relationship. That's 50% of all relationships. Most affairs are never detected. And one of the surprising things that my mom found out in her research was that tons of people will have affairs even though they're happy in their marriage. You don't have to be unhappy to have an affair. 56% of the men and 34% of the women in one of my mom's studies said they cheated though their marriage was happy. And she said lots of couples came in to see her where that was the situation. But not only the cheated on partner, but the cheater seemed genuinely surprised that this had happened in their marriage. Which brings us to our next story about the cheaters lurking inside any relationship. We were at act two of our show, act two, the Italian job. This story comes from James Brawley, who told it at the storytelling series, The Moth, in front of a live audience. I am sitting on my suitcase uh, in the main train station in Rome, uh, next to my girlfriend, Susan, who's sitting on hers. And uh, we're rifling through our Let's Go Europe, trying to agree on the uh, next destination of our vacation. Uh, Susan grew up in Germany, uh, so she'll go basically any place, <laughs> as long as it's sunny. But I need to go to the right place, and I have a pathological terror of going to the wrong place. So whenever Susan suggests some place in particular, I suggest some place else, because I can see something wrong with every place. And this is a gift I bring uh, to every area of my life. Uh, notably, my relationship with Susan. We've been together for about seven years since college, and every time she brings up the uh, subject of commitment, maybe it's a good time to get married, I, I say, I, I think uh, I need a little more time just to make sure that what we're doing is right. So, uh, as a result, all of the lights on the arrivals and departures board are blinking. And the man on the public address system keeps saying "depazione" over and over and over again. And Susan is up on her feet, screaming at me, make up your mind before all the trains pull out. Well, I am kind of hypnotized by this hem of this flower print dress that's about 10 feet away, fluttering in the breeze each time a train pulls in or out of the station, which at this point is frequent which is hanging off what may be the most beautiful woman I have ever seen, uh, who's standing next to her beautiful friend. When Susan says, are you looking at those women? And I say, where? <laughs> and she says, right there in the flower print dresses. And I say, you mean them? And she says, yes, they look interesting, don't they? Like, maybe they're going someplace interesting. We might want to go. You know what? I think I'll ask them. And before I can tell her what a bad idea that is, she's over there talking to them in French. And they're pointing at me. And a few minutes later, she's introducing them to me. Isabel 